In Central Park, a woman is making her way down the avenue. It's a sunny spring day, and the new fresh buds are on the trees, heralding the new life of spring. Everything is teeming with little teases of green here and there, and the warm weather suddenly beckons away the gray, dismal bleakness of winter. And the woman makes her way down, and she sits herself on a park bench, surveying the area and looking at different people. This is Tamara, and Tamara is something of a woman of a different profession, and she is seeking clients to match her profession. And as she sits on the bench surveying potential clients, such as lonely men or disgruntled men or men seeking pleasures of the flesh, she notices a figure pass by. And as she notices the figure grow closer, her eyes suddenly pay attention to the different couples around her. And of course, it being spring, it inspires the best out of lovers. And the sudden affection and display thereof set in sight a feeling of envy and sadness within Tamara. And she pensively sits down and hangs her head a little bit lower and her shoulders droop as though under the burden of this kind of envious grief. And the figure grows closer and it turns out to be a young dark haired man. Joel sits down beside Tamara, not really noticing what is happening around him or paying attention to the couples. He seems to be thoroughly absorbed in his own inner turmoil. Tamara notices as she sits back, she observes the young man sitting beside her. He seems distracted, engrossed in his own thoughts. She wonders what has weighed so heavily on this young man. His brow is furrowed like an old man. And it seems that there's dark thoughts clouding his countenance. She stops and stares for a while in concern. And she wonders if perhaps this young man, so, so much wrestling with turmoil, might actually welcome a distraction of, pleasant, of ple pleasantries of the flesh. So she decides to engage the young man. So she speaks up. She says, Hello there. Hello. Well, you seem lost in your thoughts, young man. What's eating you? Nothing. I'm just waiting for someone. I see, she says. She wonders if he's waiting for a girlfriend, a sweetheart. She's a little bit wary, but she wonders if maybe she could be a distraction between the young man and his girlfriend. If the girlfriend is the source of his turmoil, perhaps she would be even a more welcome distraction from such a tumultuous lover. So Tamara continues. She says, I see. Well, I think I'm waiting for someone as well, but they haven't shown up yet. How about yours? Hmm, nope. And she says, and who might you be waiting for? Who am I waiting for? Oh, just family member and she says i see she's a little bit wary family member could mean anything it could mean a parent a sibling or perhaps much to her chagrin a wife still he looks a little bit too young to be wedded so young and right away but she does wonder with that look on his face perhaps he married too young and now he's regretting his decision Although Tamara isn't the one to break up a happy marriage, if he's unhappy, she's more than welcome to be a distraction for an unhappy one. So she gently plies again. She says, I see, she says. Well, how long have you been waiting? Have they abandoned you here in the park all by your lonesome? No, they wouldn't abandon me. I didn't mean it like that, she apologizes. I meant to say that, you know, it's taken them so long to get here. It sort of makes you wonder if you're a priority for them. And then he sighs. 
Well, I don't think my whole, in my whole life, have I ever really been a priority for them? It seems like they are just obsessed with getting me to meet their standards, but they never really gave a crap about what I really wanted. Tamara's confused. He's using a plural noun. She's not sure if he's referring to two family members or if he's referring to his wife as, as a double noun. She's a confused, but she continues. And she says, I see, she said. So are these people, these family members, are they your parents? And he laughs and then he looks at her. Yes, they are. Who else? She says, oh, I was just curious. I'm rather sorry that you have to have such parents. It seems that they're the selfish type, aren't they? Just sort of cramming and molding you, you know, sculpting you into, into their own kind of mold, right? Somewhat. And then he kind of looks to the side. I would say that my mother is the one who is like that. My father, he is kind, but at the same time, he enables my mother. Tamara nods and she says, I see. It seems like your mother reminds me a good deal of my own parents. And I'm rather sorry that you have a mother like that. And I'm rather sorry that your father, despite being a good and gentle man, enables her. So they sort of have a chain around your neck, don't they? Yes, exactly. And I have to do everything that they want me to do because I'm their only child. And, you know, they quote unquote, put so much effort into raising me. And she says, Tamara thinks a bit and she says, well, it seems they took effort into raising you into what they wanted to be rather than what they knew was best for you. I think those are two very different things, don't you? Hmm. I guess so. She's like, so how old are you? 24. I see. Have you ever thought of setting out on your own? Not yet. I'm saving up money. I see. That's a rather hard thing to do. It's rather hard waiting until you saved enough and then you can finally break free from them and, you know, sort of cleave off of your own parents, as it says. Right, exactly. It's much more difficult than it sounds. It, I imagine it would be difficult. Well, once you save up the money, what do you plan to do when you set out? Hmm, I think I would just get my own apartment. That sounds like a very wise idea. So do you have any career planned or do you already have a job? I'm currently a bookkeeper. I see. Do you like that kind of job? I suppose it's not too bad. She says, well, if you could be anything else, what would you be besides a bookkeeper? And he shrugs. I don't think there really is a choice. You know, in many things in life, you don't have a choice. The comment suddenly resonates with her as her own profession wasn't entirely her own choice either, but rather a force of circumstances. Her eyes widen a bit, and then her eyes kind of lull back a bit into a restive state. And she nods knowingly, and she says softly and thoughtfully, she says, oh yes, that's very true. A lot of times we have no choices. There's no choices before us, and we have to take what we're given. Absolutely. She looks down on the ground rather thoughtfully, sort of getting lost in her own thoughts or rather her own sadness. But she tries to shake it off and engage with the man once more. And she says, well, do you have any pastimes or hobbies? And he's like, oh, what does it matter? They don't matter, mean anything in the long run, do they? No, but at least they give your life some sort of Welcome distraction. It makes the grind of daily life a little bit bearable, don't you think? Do you have any? And she thinks, I, I think I do. I, I like to read a lot. 
and I I like to do things that I guess some people would say are sort of the uh, what's that word you want to use the occult a little bit. Mm, I see the occult. She's like, yes, uh, mostly like tarot and palm reading, um, that sort of thing. You know, st- looking at studying different things. Um, it sounds very stupid, but, you know, sort of the theatricality of it all, too, is rather fascinating, like gazing into crystal balls or, you know, that sort of thing. Nothing really strange or bizarre, but just something that's theatrical and has sort of a, a beauty to it, a bit of a performance, don't you think? Mm-hmm. And then he nods. I see. I guess, he says. Yeah, there's a lot of things that are theatrical in this world. He's like, yes, there are. It's it's nice to have things that are theatrical. It distracts us from how things really are, that things are so mundane and dismal and just so ordinary. It's nice to think on the extraordinary once in a while. Yeah, he nods. And he looks at her for a brief second before gazing off again. That's definitely true. One of my my friends, Sam, he's really into this kind of, you know, acting and this kind of idea of being enthralled by the supernatural and basically kind of being theatrical, like you said. She says, that's rather interesting. I imagine he's quite a insightful or at least a very audacious fellow. Oh, he definitely is. I think it's because he doesn't want to get sucked into the mundane like I have or anyone else, really. I guess 99% of people are sucked into the mundane. And she nods. Oh, yes, they are. And sometimes the mundane isn't... How do I say? The mundane is even worse than what we think it is. Definitely, he nods. He says, well... I was going to ask you, are you sure you don't have any hobbies or pastimes? Like, do you like music or reading or anything like that? He's like, I do have some. And he crosses his arms. What do you think they are? And she says, well, hmm. I got to admit, part of my, part of my, my studies, if you will, involve trying to figure out people. I'm trying to figure you out, but it's rather hard. You're a little, what's that word? Not mysterious, but something deeper than a mystery, an enigma. You're enigmatic, and there's something about you. It's like you're hiding behind a shield or something. Even the way you cross your arms, it seems like you've put up a wall of defense. It's hard to read you. And he's like, I see. Well, what does tarot tell you? You know, if you got your cards up, would you be able to tell anything about me? I guess if you came over, I would gladly oblige you with a session of tarot. I, well, here's the strange thing. I don't know your name. And he's like, I don't know yours either. And she's like, well, mine's Tamara. Sort of, uh, sort of like the biblical one, if you will. I see. And what's yours? My name is Joel. Joel. That's also biblical as well, isn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. She's like, that's interesting, Joel. I like that name. A minor prophet, right? Yes. It's a nice name, Joel. Joel. She tries to sound out the name three times under her tongue. Joel. Hmm. It's a sort of, you can tell a lot by a person's name, I think. And the way you've given your name and the way it sounds and the way it matches with your face and your body and the way you act, I would have to say it suits you. I think it's a name that, I think you feel confident in some things, but not so confident in other things. And maybe it's these things that have given you confident that, you're not overly proud of. Maybe it's done something detrimental to you and now you're no longer passionate about it. And this is why you really don't have any hobbies or passions. Am I right? 
And he's like, hmm, well, I do have some, but I don't think you guessed them correctly. Well, I don't know exactly what they are. I'm trying to figure you out. I'm thinking, hmm, you're a person that likes intellectual sort of things. I think you're a thinker. You like philosophy a lot, don't you? Correct me if I'm wrong. I think I'm, I think you're right. I see, I see. You like philosophy, you like debating philosophy, and you like to prove people wrong or else prove a cynical point because maybe you don't necessarily embrace or appreciate optimism. Hmm. Well, optimism works for some people, but maybe not for others. That is very true. But what's to say that it doesn't work in all cases, in all circumstances? Well, it's, I think it's because reality is so subjective. And she says, I see. That is true. It is subjective. I'm trying to figure more out about you, Joel. I'm trying to look at you. Well, I can do some palm reading. What if I read your palm? Sure. He hands so her takes, his, his palm, his left he, one. She takes his palm and she says, hmm, it's rather interesting. What's so interesting? Well, your different lines here, they're all... They're all converging with one another, and then they branch off. It seems like you have a lot of conflict with yourself, not so much with others, but with yourself. Hmm, maybe. Yeah, but don't we I, all have conflict with ourselves? Not everyone does. Some people are very self-assured. Some people are very happy with themselves. And some people are just confident. But while they're confident and happy with themselves, they may have conflict with other people. So their lines look a little bit different. And I also see here too that it's rather hard to read your palm a little bit. It, I think it's because you're very tight and defensive, aren't you? He's like, I don't think I am. Maybe not with me, per se. I mean, after all, you are showing your palm to a complete stranger, but I think maybe you're afraid to get close to people, aren't you? And so you'd rather talk to strangers, wouldn't you? And she laughs a little bit. Hmm, maybe that's why I am talking to you. And he kind of smiles very softly and very subtly. Tamara senses the smile and smiles back. And she gives out a, a small, quiet laugh under her breath. She's like, well, I'm honored that I'm very honored that you've designated such an accolade on me. Well, I wouldn't say it's an accolade. We're both just wasting time waiting for someone to come, right? No, but you could have ignored me or told me to go sit on another bench. But you've been very kind and you've talked with me. You've learned my name and you even let me read your poem. And he's like, how about you? How about your palm? What does it say? Oh, my palm isn't really that important. It's full of a lot of mistakes. And sometimes I really can't read my own palm. It's hard to read your own palm. That makes sense. I guess sometimes you need someone else to see your own problems, right? That's very true, Joel. That's very true. That's very insightful of you. Right. So she says, well, do you have any, well, you said you had one friend. I mean, do you have any, say, girlfriends? Mm. He suddenly flinches just a tiny bit. He's trying to hide it, but he, it seems like he was a bit uncomfortable by that question. But then he recovers it almost instant instantaneously look, and looks back at Tamara and his eyes are focused on hers trying to make up for that little slip. No, I mean, sorry, I mean, I I'm not really sure what you mean. Well, you have friends, you have family. So it stands to reason that a young, healthy man like yourself, with a lot of social grace and charm that you have, 
it would stand to reason you would have a girlfriend, wouldn't you? And when he looks on the floor and then he looks back at her and he's like, you know, um, I don't really think so because, you know, a lot of things don't work out sometimes, you know, it's not like A plus B equals C in life. That is true, Joel. So you don't have a girlfriend right now then, do you? And then he shakes his head. No, I don't. I see. That's rather... That must be rather lonesome for you. Do you do you want a girlfriend or no? No. And why don't you want a girlfriend? Um, well, I don't think I need one because I know society tells you you should have one, but I mean other than that, why should I have one? That's true, but don't you ever get lonely and you know, how do I say it? Crave the companionship of someone, maybe someone to, you know, warm your heart as well as your body. Joel looks slightly uncomfortable and then he shakes his head. No, I don't think I need that. You know, I already have a lot of people in my life and I can draw sustenance from my books, my studies, my job and my friends. Well, that's remarkable to be so fulfilled with all this. But I wonder why you don't seem fulfilled. Hmm, well, there's a lot of reasons why. Would you like to elaborate on that, Joel? Well, maybe it has to do with my parents. That's true. But once you leave them, you can set out on your own. Maybe find a different job. Maybe you'll find a nice girl that really appreciates you. And he shrugs. Well, you know, I don't really think I need that. You know, everyone's different and and it's just hard. I mean, I don't understand the point of having something when there's no need for it, you know, and it's very all it's all very subjective. Oh, it is, but I think everybody has the same basic desires and so you don't want the companionship of a woman then? Not really. I mean, I don't see the necessity for it. Well, it's not necessarily a necessity. It's not like air or food or water, but it does make life perhaps a little bit bearable, especially for men. You know, um, men desire certain things. You know, they are, well, I don't know. Tell me this, Joel, if you can be so honest. Are men really creatures that are sort of governed by their desires, especially of their body? And then Joel blinks and he says, I think it really depends on the person you're talking to. Not all men are like that, I think. Most are. Tamara blinks and she looks thoughtfully. She's never really had any man express that before. It seems almost every other man who hasn't flatly out rejected her services has really shown his true colors as being a creature who's governed by his desires of the flesh. She reflects on Joel's answer, and she says, well, I see. She says, well, I'm rather, I'm rather astounded by your answer, Joel. So you're telling me that you're not like other men who would want to be, you know, driven by their desires? He shakes his head. I don't think anything would come of it. I mean, what do you get out of these desires? It's like eating junk food. She says, that may be so, but so many men can't resist it. And they desire it with such a ferocity. And then they take what they want. And there's a hint of bitterness at the end of her voice. He can sense it. And he continues, I don't think that's right. You know, I don't think people should be taking whatever they want without regard to what other people want. Well, lots of people don't care what other people want. And they'll just take what they want and it doesn't matter to them. And some people know that they want it and they give it to them, whether or not they really enjoy it at all. And then he blinks. I don't think it would be enjoyable for me. I see. Lots of men would find it enjoyable, though. They actually sort of crave it. He's saying, I don't crave it. 
you're a very unusual young man. Here I thought you would be bursting with passion and desire and all sorts of things, but instead you're almost like a you're almost like a calm stoic of antiquity, aren't you? He's like, you know, you can believe whatever you want about me. Well, I I didn't mean it like that. I, I actually meant it in in an admirable sort of way. And she kind of looks aside kind of thoughtfully and a bit sad. Mm, I see. He's like, I'm sorry if I sounded rude. I mean, sorry, I just didn't know how to react because a lot of people might not like what I'm saying. No, I, I like what you're saying. I, I think it's rather unusual, but it would be nicer if there were more men like that in the world. And she kind of starts sort of un- nervously, you know, sort of rubbing her hands together. She's worried if she can get Joel as a client, but then at the same time, she's very moved by his answers. And she really wonders if there's more men like him out in the world that would make it a better place. Right. And he's like, well, you know, I think Sam, my friend, is similar to me as well in some ways. He says, and then she kind of perks up a little bit and she says, really? I think it was the way we were raised more than anything. And how were you raised, Joel? I'm kind of interested. I'd like to know. Well, okay, let's talk about Sam first because myself is a bit different. I don't think it has really to do with the way I was raised. Well, it does, but not as much as Sam. Sam was raised to be social justice minded. His parents were socialists and are still socialists, but not as extreme. Because back in Russia, you know, I heard that his father actually threw a couple of bombs. And her eyes widen and she's like, well, that's remarkable, but well, they're rather moralistic, aren't they? These socialists, aren't they? They can be, but I think Sam doesn't want that. He wants to be worldly. He wants to be someone who's open-minded, but at the same time, I know he's holding back from a lot of things that he does want to engage in. She's like, I see. I wonder, I wonder how he would, um, does he desire a lot of different things? He desires fame above all. I see. So would he ever think of, I don't know, I guess for lack of a better word, satisfying the other pleasures that people crave? Yeah, he eats a lot of pastrami. Well, I didn't always mean like that. I I mean, you know, sort of like, you know, desires of other things, you know, like the, you know, desires of the body, so to speak. But pastrami is a desire of the body. Well, I mean, I suppose it is, but I mean, you know, like, how do I say something that only another human body can fulfill oh i think he did it she's like he did oh that's interesting was it with a girlfriend of his yes oh that's typical and she says and joel i know that you don't have any desires like these so tell me what is it about you that makes you not go after it what makes you not you know, hunger for a little bit of pleasure. Well, what's the point of it? I always, I'm very utilitarian, Tamara. I always ask myself before I do something or want to do something, what's the point of this? Will it cause more pain than anything else? She's like, well, what if you did it with someone there were no consequences to? What if you just decided for once to react on you know, the own, how do I say, your own body instincts and did it with someone who was willing to help you be satisfied. Hmm. He's like, I don't see the point of it. Why do I need to be satisfied? Well, don't you ever have any sort of longing? I mean, nothing, no sort of tender awakening of an ache within yourself? He blanks. I don't think so. I mean, have you ever not ever looked at a woman and think she's attractive and then suddenly something stirs within you? Hmm. 
Well, it doesn't matter anyways. Maybe you should think about it, Joel. I mean, why deny yourself like some sort of, you know, aesthetic uh, monk? I mean, why not, you know, you know, there are people, I mean, there are women out there who would appreciate helping you with that and, you know, providing you a way to, to find out how you would enjoy that. And he suddenly gets suspicious because he had never, you know, been approached by a woman to talk about these very personal things. And he looks at her kind of suspiciously and he's like, hmm, I didn't know you were a sex therapist. She's like, (laughs) she laughs. Oh, I don't know if that sort of thing exists. It's rather too big for my vocabulary, but. And it sort of sounds like a modern profession, but you might as well, I might as well tell you the truth, Joel. My profession is a lot older. My profession is rather ancient. And I guess you found me out. And I wonder if you're ready to condemn me for it. I don't condemn you. I just said I'm not interested. That's true. You didn't condemn me. So I thank you for that. So... You wouldn't be interested then, and I promise I'd, I would give you an excellent service. I'd make you feel very, very comfortable. And then she kind of reaches out and she sort of playfully traces her fingers over his sleeve. And then he says, well, you know, I don't want it. Like I said, I don't see any point of being satisfied. What's the point of that? There should be more to life than just that. Well, yes, but your life is full of so many other things. The strain of your parents, the strain of your job, just living in this dismal gray world. I mean, wouldn't you ever just like to taste a little bit of ecstasy of the flesh just to get away from it all, even if for a moment? No, he shakes his head. There's no point in that. Like I said, why would you just want to get away just to come back? And also, there's no point in just doing it because your body tells you to do it. I'll fight even harder. And she's like, but why fight the body? Why not succumb to it? And you wouldn't be hurting anyone. That's what I'm telling you. You wouldn't be hurting. I mean, for someone like me, you'd actually be helping me in a way. And, you know, it might actually be sort of a a good business relationship, don't you think? No, he shakes his head. I won't do it. Jesus, I see. So you're just sort of content to remain passionless and never do anything with your body as young and healthy as it is. I think he makes an annoyed face, which promptly fades away. And he's like, ah, it's none of your business what I choose to do with myself. You don't, you only want the money, right? He's like, at first it started out like that, but no, I'm rather interested and I'm, and she kind of looks down kind of sadly. And she's like, I know that's what it probably all seems like. And maybe at the end of the day, just trying to survive, maybe that's all I'll think about. But now in this moment, I, I do want to help you out. And I, I think that you're too nice of a man just to be denied pleasures and I, like I said, I would provide very good services towards you. And I think I might actually like you. It would actually be more than business if you would accept that. And then he shakes his head. I can't accept it. And my parents are going to be coming here very soon, I think. And she says, I see. Well, I guess I better go. I guess your parents will figure out what I am and They probably wouldn't want their son, you know, consorting with a harlot, so I better go. And he's like, you can stay a little bit longer. I think it'll take them around 10 minutes. She's like, well, as much as I'd like to stay and talk, I wouldn't want to tarnish your reputation. And after all, you said yourself it's pointless, so maybe I should leave. It's... But it was nice talking to you, and I'm grateful for your your kindness and politeness, Joel. It meant a lot. It's I don't meet men like you at all, and I hope I meet more men like you, and 
maybe more men who have a balance of that, you know. And I mm. hope that you do find somebody. I think you will, despite you being so cold and defensive. He's like, I don't think I'm being defensive. I'm just telling the truth. Maybe you are, but I feel like you have put a wall around yourself and maybe you don't realize that. Maybe it's a lot like palms. You have to have someone else look at your problems before you realize you have one. And he's like, how about you? What, what's your problem? She looks to the side. And then she looks down on the ground and then she looks at Joel with her big wide eyes and she says, I have a lot of problems, Joel, a lot of problems that I shouldn't burden you with. I have a lot of regrets, a lot of mistakes, and I don't know how else to explain it that would make sense to you. You're an innocent, upstanding citizen, and I'll let you remain that way. I'll go and let you tend to your own business, and I won't further contaminate your presence. So I'll get going. And then he just bows his head, uncertain what to say next. And he's like, well, thank you for your time. Goodbye. And she says, goodbye, Joel. And then she, hur she hurriedly leaves going to the other side of the park. 